Welcome back to the Cage Rage Podcast. This is Devin, and I am joined by Miguel Iterati. It's uh, we've been a little slack to this week, uh, Miguel. So we got a lot to cover. We uh, we didn't get get to this on Sunday. We've got a lot of things to recap that happened in this past week in the world of mixed martial arts. First, I want to start just by greeting you. How are you doing, Miguel? Good. Glad to be back aboard here at the CRP. And uh, yeah, I agree. We got a lot to talk about. I don't think the uh, Mexico UFC is something. We should spend a ton of time on, you know, we're going to get the main event again. And uh, there's just, there's just been a lot of eye pokes lately, you know? Yeah, that would, that, that is where we were going to start just uh, since we didn't get to it Sunday, just recapping just briefly, as you said, UFC Mexico uh, main event ends in a disastrous eye poke. Uh, Yair Rodriguez breaks the eyes of Jeremy Stevens, who first off, I just want to start by saying Jeremy Stevens has been one of the most game fighters in the sport for the past decade has been in there with about everybody in his division. He is definitely not somebody who ever looks for a way out of a fight. It was an unfortunate finish only about 15 seconds into the fight. And um, as you just mentioned um, a little bit ahead of me on that, um, according to Brett Okamoto of ESPN, they are going to run this back and this will be October 18th, I believe in um in boston and this will be the co-main event behind the um dominic reyes versus uh chris weiden bout in boston headlining a ufc on espn card so uh they're gonna run that back and um you i believe that that was the right move what do you think miguel yeah you know i i, I would almost look at it as something I, I i'd start putting in contracts you know what i mean the bottom line is is with the gloves and stuff there's not much you can do you know around policing it except for having people hyper aware but you know it's clear to me that there's no detriment so guys like you know the real sophisticated guys like the dominic cruises the uh you know john joneses and guys they you know may even practice you know the the finger use with the gloves and, and and pushing on the face and things like that you know what i mean these are techniques that are, are 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 available to the fighters, and they're not going to stop using it without some type of deterrent. Now, if in the contract it says you wind up in an eye poke and a no contest, especially in the first round of the fight, then yeah, you're obligated to for a redo in a month, and you got to be ready for it, or else uh, we're we're renegotiating contracts or something like that. Uh, I, I'm open for it. There's just been too many of it. You know what I mean? Um, and and again, I think it it has to do with the fact that there are some defensive techniques that are, you know, based on pushing away and, and clinching and, 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 and the open hand. And, you know, you're, uh, unless you do something about it, uh, you're periodically going to get this. And now in Mexico City, where they've been, uh, you know, stutter starting, trying to get off in a market that's fight heavy, you know, in terms of Mexico is boxing, basically. You know, the people there love fights. If they can find the right star, they're going to make a mint there. They've been trying for a little while. Now they go back. they got a homegrown main event guy in Yair Rodriguez, and they wind up giving the crowd 15 seconds. So it's not a good look for the UFC. Um, it, it's overall just a bad circumstance. And, yeah, I, I don't think you can blame Jeremy Stevens, but uh, I'd like to see something like, the redos of, of this type of fight happen more often. We've had eye pokes in the last month, you know, uh, mess up other fights and uh, other organizations have had, uh, you know, their big time main events end and stuff like that. So it's something that, you know, maybe you do have to say, hey, you know, if you're going to use the techniques and push away on the face and, and, and you're in, involved with, uh, with, with in a match that ends that way, then, yeah, you're you're going to, you know, you get two shows, two two show monies. Nobody nobody's gonna knock that. Yeah, one thing we do gotta throw some comments about is the way that the Mexico City crowd reacted. Has got a lot of has been got a lot of criticism since Saturday. They reacted throwing beer into the ring and a lot of uh, other um, concession material, and uh, I. You can't say it wasn't despicable, but at the same time, 
you can you can also see their frustration a little bit, but I, that's why I did want to bring up at the beginning about Jeremy Stevens just being a notoriously game competitor that he wasn't just trying to find his way out and, and to soil the main event down there in Mexico City. He trained very – I believe he went to Mexico for several months to prepare for this fight. So this was um, th- this was definitely a lost opportunity for both of them. I understood Yair's frustration. He looked like he was very pent up with a lot of – aggression that he wasn't able to get out in the in the fight and he actually even took that out on michael bisping i don't even i don't know if you saw that where bisping tried to put his hand on his shoulder before their post fight interview and he just quickly jerked his shoulder away and started hurling insults in spanish toward michael bisping so um i think that this is definitely where they need to go um moving on but um also looking at the co-main event though there is some other stuff other thing i, I do want to highlight you just talked about them trying to groom a mexico mexican star I think uh, Alexa Grasso could be that star. And she, after Saturday, is definitely one of my favorite female fighters today. This was a very close fight. I had to go rewatch it. And I can understand how somebody would have scored this a draw, how they could have gave those first two rounds to Esparza. Round three, I definitely had that as a 10-8 and for Grasso. She came so close to finishing the fight. She had her hurt several times. She had her hurt at the end of the second round also. And in the first round, I thought the first round I gave to Grasso watching it live. That's why I was really upset with that decision. First round was a lot closer than I remember, but man, when I look at this, man, it, it, this is a perfect fight to point to of why we need to really discuss the scoring system in MMA. Because to me, Grasso, yeah, she got taken down multiple times in the first couple rounds, but Esparza was really not able to do much with it. And on the feet, Grasso w- was better at, at, w- with her strike, uh, stri- uh, with her striking than I've seen. Sniper like, very patient, kept a good distance. Her takedown offense has, trem- has improved tremendously since the Tatiana Suarez fight. Um, Grasso, I feel like, is just, just a little bit of perfecting her way from being a real contender in this division. Um, I didn't feel that way with Carla Esparza. I felt like this was the same Carla Esparza we've seen for years. She fought tough. She hung tough. Her getting out of that arm bar in the third round was incredible. But to me, I was very disappointed with this decision because when I look at Grosso, I see somebody I want to see fight the elite. I want to see her fight the Michelle Watersons and the Joanna and Dre Checks and, and the Nina Ansarovs. And I want to see her go up in the division. And then when I see Esparza, I just, you know, I just still see a journeyman in the middle, and I was really hoping that Grasso would get over this hump and go into contendership. What do you think of this fight, Miguel? Yeah, I, I would have liked to have seen Grasso uh, get the nod on this one. I, I think she deserves it. I think, you know, fighting in her hometown, you know, you kind of wonder, you know, um, you know, it, it's a, it's an overreaction to me. You know, a takedown is a takedown, but every takedown needs to be looked at in a certain context. You know what I mean? And I agree. You know, if if I if I take a guy down and I wind up on top in guard, and I've got basically my head and his stomach, and maybe even my arm, my hands cinched behind his back, that was a defensive takedown. That was a takedown that you're executing to stay safe. And therefore, it's not really, it, but it, yet in, in MMA, it's credited as an offensive maneuver. Well, I think it's because and, they're putting and, the. Yeah, I, think, yeah, I mean, the control part, but again, the control of, of the fight, you know, effective aggression. What's effective aggression? That's not effective. A, a takedown that leads to nothing on top is not effective aggression. Not in my book. I and, agree. And, and I, I've judged a little bit. So, you know. Um, uh, you know, it becomes a, it becomes a defensive move, and if you look at the pecking order, defense is like you know, excellent defense loses you rounds. It's like number four on on what you're looking at. You know, you can get some points for getting a, you know, or some credit for maybe getting out of an arm bar like as far as it did, but then you know, you wanted to give it a 10-8 round, which you know is sort of a shooto rule from Japan where they call uh, a catch on a near submission. And the ref uh, will have to signal it, you know, in, in their case, in the rules. But you could, you could judge it a 10-8 round based on the near submission. Um, you know, that's an, an adjustment to uh, what would be effective aggression. The other girl had to put on a defensive show and actually, you know, 
really exert herself to get out or else you've got the fight over. That's a catch in, in Shudo and, and uh, you know, maybe should be credited as such. There's, I think the issue is without a punch knockdown, there's no MMA judge that's going to just give you a 10-8 round based on, on being really good uh, and effective on the ground. It just happens extremely rarely. Well, that third round wasn't just a submission attempt, though. She had as far as a hurt very early in that round, and I, I would be interested to go in, in to see the um, percentage of her strikes that they landed because it seemed like pretty much. First of all, I've never seen Grasso so composed and so patient with her striking, and it seemed like pretty much every time she threw a strike, she was cracking Esparza. And you you brought up those first two rounds with the takedowns, and, and they were defensive, and I completely agree with you because she was getting lit up on the feet that whole fight. And Esparza did land some shots, but it, it was basically in the middle of combinations from Grasso that Grasso was landing. She got hit, but she was giving him right back. Um, I felt like that was Grosso's game plan. It was to get her to open up. Asparza did a good job just constantly going back to the wrestling, but very close fight. But I um, I do like the pride rules that they look at some of the overall fight. And also, um, I don't think that there's something that we need to really worry about with um, having draws. I think draws are okay. I think that we need more draws because this, if at the very least, this was a draw of a fight. And at least that doesn't make somebody go backwards and put an L on their record that they shouldn't have had. And speaking of draws, I do want to talk a little bit about Brandon Marino and Askar Askarov. They battled to a split a split draw in a nonstop action fight. Maybe the fight of the night. I thought it was Grasso and Esparza, but this was a um, this was a good fight, and it showed that the flyweight division still has some talent. This was a very good fight, and um, once again, just talking about draws, I don't think anybody really is faulting that this was a draw. I think that both these guys fought a very good fight. Neither one of them deserved an L on a record. Maybe neither one of them put in enough work to really get the W. Um, it was a very even fight, and I, I had no problem with this being a draw. Yeah, no, me neither. And, and it was exciting. I think it was a nice highlight for the 125-pounders. I think, you know, we're firmly in the Sejudo era, and I know we're going to get to him, and uh, beyond the Demetrius Johnson era now. And, uh, you know, I think it's good they you know, they've got guys that are stepping up you know, and uh, putting on showcase fights. Moreno, we've known about for a little bit. Askarov, a little bit of a new flavor, but, you know, uh, we've known about Dagestan and, and Southern Russia being a hotbed for fighters and stuff, and he comes from that mold. So uh, I get excited when I, I hear, you know, highly trained guys from camps like that come are coming to this weight class because at the end of the day, the smallest guys are usually the, the more – uh, technically fluid in the ring. You know what I mean? They're, they're, it's where you see the most wide variety of techniques. I agree. And moving on to the last one I want to recap from last weekend, I thought Irene Aldana looked excellent. Uh, and I know she fought on a UFC newcomer who definitely didn't seem to really live up to any expectations that they had to compete with her. But Aldana came in number nine in, in the division at 135 pounds. Dude, she was she she looked great with her striking. Was throwing great leg kicks. Her her punches looked great. She was switch uh, she was switching her stance well. Her she never came close to even being affected by the grappling. Um, I think Aldana's a a legit top ten uh, contender right now at um, uh, at 135 pounds for the bantamweight. She has one loss on her record in the UFC, and I think I think she deserves to be highlighted because she she fought a very good fight over the weekend. Yeah, I think it, you know, I think it was a, a showcase for the women's divisions in, in in the UFC this week, especially with the dud in in the main event. Uh, you're left with little else uh, that's uh, that's important. Yeah, and I agree with you. This girl is somebody that you know uh, will hopefully be a factor in a uh, you know the the for the next title you know a, a, after after uh the dominant champion uh you know they they either move her to super fights or she goes to 145 i'm talking obviously about amanda nunez i don't want to see her in there with amanda nunez yet there's still cavernous difference in in in, in where things are but i agree with you uh aldon has given us something to be excited about i agree and we're going to move on just to preview this weekend it's ufc bout we got 
And all I want to do, because I looked at the, over the card, and we, we've got so much to talk about today that I do want to just kind of cover just the main event and just move on from there. You do got Gunnar Nelson coming back to fight an old vet in Tiago Alves. I think that that's an interesting fight. I think it might be a little bit um, – I think Alves might be just a little bit past his prime to be going in there with somebody like Gunner. That seems to be kind of like a gimme fight for Gunner at this point. Um, but I could be wrong. I mean, the striking advantage will definitely be for Alves. But Hermanson and Cannonier, these are two guys who have really just come out of nowhere and have become middleweight contenders, especially Jared Cannonier. Jane and Cannonier was just a journeyman at light heavyweight. Started at heavyweight, dropped down to light heavyweight, then dropped down to middleweight on short notice gets thrown in there with a rank contender, David Branch, and goes in there and knocks him out in the second round. Then he comes back after that and gets matched up with Anderson Silva, and Anderson Silva suffers a leg injury off of a Cannoneer kick, and that fight's ended in the first round. So now you got Cannoneer coming in ranked right now as the number nine ranked contender in the middleweight division. Hermanson's been on a fantastic run. He submitted David Branch also in like, 45 seconds with a head and arm guillotine and then also just came off a huge win in a five round bout with Jacare Souza. So this is about right now. You've got Costa up there as the number one contender after the upcoming Adesanya Whitaker bout Romero, obviously still in the mix. Kelvin Gaslam's fighting Darren Till in his middleweight debut. I think after this, the winner of this is right there behind the Costa and Romero in the mix for a title fight. This is, I think, a very pivotal bout. The winner of this, you got Hermanson coming in in ranked number five in the division. I think the winner of this will have a top five ranking after their name. And it, that would be such a just rise fast. I mean, you you would have to look at Jared Cannon here as one of the breakout fighters of the year maybe if he goes in here and wins because he came from just being a journeyman light heavyweight to being now a, a legit contender at middleweight. But I think the same can be said about Jack Hermanson. Jack Hermanson wins this, and he's had a great year. These are two of the most breakout fighters of the year right now in this just really hot middleweight division right now. And this is happening one week before the biggest middleweight title fight in years between Robert Whitaker and Israel Adesanya. So both these guys are fighting really to put themselves into contendership. What do you say, Miguel? Yep. Uh, you know, I'm really, really excited about this fight. I think the fight is – you know, kudos to the matchmaker on this one because both guys are coming off a bigger fight, really, right? You know, stepping up to fight Jacare on short notice, stepping up, you know, to fight Anderson Silva in Brazil. Those are bigger fights, you know, on a trajectory. So now here, after your big moment where you've stepped up, now you got some fucking work to do. And I excuse the French, you know what I mean? But that's what it is here because now you take a step back in name recognition, but – the work that they're asking them to do is every bit as hard, maybe even harder because you're facing a guy in your prime and stuff. So it is going to be good to see how the mindsets react. You know, coming off a Jacare win, it's like, yeah, give me the belt shot. You know what I mean? And all of a sudden, you're, you're, you know, you're thinking, hey, I, you know, I'm the next Michael Bisping, European champion, this and that, and maybe a fantasies in Cannoneer too. You know, coming from journeyman status to where he is now, you know, he's got to be thinking, why not me? I just, you know, so. Yeah, I think it's going to be very interesting to see who can dictate in this fight and, and, and call the shots because um, they both showed mental strength. But now I think taking a, a, a you know, registering that you, you've done the big work, you didn't get the title shot. Now there's more big work ahead. It gets harder. It doesn't get easier. You know, that recognition and stuff at this point in their career as they're going up. It's going to be interesting. It's going to be very interesting to see how the flight fight plays out. It's it's an open book to me, although Hermanson, I think in the Jacare win, Hermanson's got a, a, the most advanced win on, on on the record. Anderson Silva is, is a legend, but you know mm -hmm. he's in his mid forties. Um, Jacare is still uh, basically a monster. You know what I mean? But uh, Jacare. I don't know. He may have lost four rounds in that fight. You know, that's, I, I agree. Very, very sophisticated fighting for 25 minutes for a guy coming from where Hermanson comes from. Did he blow his load, Cody Gar Garbrandt style? And then, you know, now he's going to be in a, in a fight where, you know, may, maybe something happens and, and, and uh, he takes a step back. Or does that happen to Cannoneer? So, yeah, I think there's a, t a ton a ton that goes into this fight. And the winner is going to be um, – 
in contendership yeah. for sure. And you look a lot like uh, like uh, Glover Teixeira did in 205 pounds on their way up. No one's going to want to fight the winner of this fight. That, that's a good point, and I, and I and I also think that this is very interesting with the style differentiation here. You got Hermanson's definitely more of a grappler based, Cannoneer a heavy striker. I think a lot of this is going to come down to what kind of uh, how prepared Cannoneer is going to be to dealing with the grappling, which he has struggled with in the past. But very interesting fight. I, I totally agree with you, and, and it's going to be interesting to see what new contender emerges at middleweight from there. Moving on to some other headlines, though, because I said that we I, we do have a lot, so we do got to kind of skim through these a little bit. But you got UFC Hall of Famer Rashad Evans departing from the company, and he's pondering an MMA comeback. This was granted to him by the UFC. The UFC had him on contract, grants his release. <sighs> this disappoints me a little bit because I, I think Rashad was real. I mean, I thought it was a very beautiful um, video tribute they did to him earlier this year, inducting him into the Hall of Fame. And I was so embracing him just being this mentor down there in Florida. And he's got so much respect by these new um, new fighters that are coming up. He was – the UFC had him on um, commentating jobs and stuff. So they were definitely working with him. But it sounds to me like he wants to come back and fight, and the UFC didn't want him to. And and I don't blame him. I mean, he's, he's another one that's in the BJ Penn category of just took so many losses. I mean, he couldn't take a punch. Couldn't pull the trigger. He he was like one and seven, one and eight in his last several fights. I mean, it was just it was getting embarrassing to even see him go in there and fight. He fought that one guy. I forget who that guy was. It was a guy that he would have never lost to in his prime, and he lost he lost to him. Um, I I I don't want to see Rashad Evans fight again. And um, I, it looks to me like he kind of had a sweetheart deal being set up by the UFC and. Um, then they just they they he wanted to fight again. They didn't want it, and they they just granted him his release so he can go fight somewhere else. So I think we're probably going to be seeing Rashad Evans and Bellator would be my guess. Oh, you know, say it isn't so. You know what I mean? I I, I don't know what else to say on 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 this type of thing. He's forty years old. Just to clean up a little bit of the details, he's two and seven, lost five in a row. And had gone two and two before that, so he's two and seven in his last nine fights. Um, at least three of them are knockouts, and you know, then and he's forty years old. So you know, all the questions about CTE, you know, the uh, brain injuries and things like that, they, they they have to become an issue. You know what I mean? Um, I, I, you know, in Bellator, he's going to be in there with the Chael Sonnen's and and people his age of the world and stuff like that. It's just you know, the fans have to decide they really are, are interested in that because I, I, I think that there is a limited market for some of that, but that you do run this, this you know, risk-reward situation where you got guys like this, you know, we're not short removed. Now, granted, this wasn't Bellator, at least. Uh, you know, Bellator didn't stoop to this depth, but we recently saw Chuck Liddell return, you know, and uh, the, these should be warning signs to people where guys have been, you know, you get knocked out. And, and remember, especially in the Liddell knockouts, those Liddell knockouts were memorable enough to me that the minute I heard he was considering a comeback, I was like, oh, no, 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 no. And, you know, Rashad may not be quite on that level, but, you know, again, two and seven in a career, he's 19 and eight overall. Two and seven in his last day. That means at one point he had one loss and and had a, was a, a a legacy type of fighter. So I agree with you that he should have taken the deal. He's also you know charismatic, well spoken. You know he's done well on the mic and things like that. I agree with you that he should have taken the option of fading off into into you know becoming a commentator, an analyst, and 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 doing. Those types of things and putting his all into that, you know, going back to the gym at 40 is just, you know, like I said, I, 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 going into the geriatric league of Bellator, it's it's not going back against the kills of the UFC. But at the same time, you do have to wonder on a medical end, uh, what is the risk that we're running? And, you know, again, does he really need the money? Again, those those, you know, 
go, going to sit at you know behind a mic at the UFC with a nice suit on and, and talking about the fights. You have the best seat in the house, and you get a paycheck for it. Yeah, and he's probably getting money for everything from doing seminars to coaching to training to managing. I mean, he he's got so many different avenues that I don't understand why he's doing this. And I, you just brought up his legacy. I think that he's got a very underrated legacy. I just think that he's one of those guys that's that's held on far too long. I mean, when you look at what – if he would have retired after he beat Chell Sonnen, he would have only had three losses on his resume – and they would have been to Little Nog, John Jones, and um, Leota Machida, and only one finish that he would have had. But he's got names on his on his win record like Chell Sonnen, Dan Henderson, Phil Davis, Tito Ortiz, Rampage Jackson, Forrest Griffin, Chuck Liddell, Michael Bisping. He beat all those guys. At one point, Rashad Evans really did have a very good resume. And you just talk, you talked about him going to Bellator, and, man, Bellator's got to get out of that. We've been talking about that for a long time. They've had a better year. I've actually been very impressed with Bellator this year. I think that this has been their best year yet. And we're going to talk a little bit about that going forward with their with their Featherweight Grand Prix that they got going on this weekend, the second part of it. Um, the uh, Them just buying up the – I mean, yeah, they could probably bring him in there and have him in there with Fedor or bring him in there and have him against Tito again or bring him in there and put him against Rampage Jackson again, which is my guess is probably where they're going to go with it. But it – I don't understand the motivation for that. I don't. I don't understand why that they they seem to think that that's a good marketing strategy. They need to continue bringing up these new um, these new talent that they have. You know, they instead of putting money into Rashad Evans, they need to go out and try to find somebody that can compete with Ryan Bader. They need to try to go broaden their their talent market so that they can actually have some competition in those higher weight classes. In my opinion, but moving on from here. Um, Dana White, who has been really resistant of GSP even coming back, is now coming out and saying, you know, oh, yeah, we're open to him fighting Khabib if Ferguson falls through. He said the same thing about Connor. We already covered that last week, Miguel. The, uh, he just keeps giving indications, and if this happens, I'm sure Tony will come out and expose it. He keeps giving these indications that we're going to lowball the hell out of Tony Ferguson, and when he turns it down, then we're going to pivot toward Connor McGregor or George St. Pierre. And now with them coming out with George St. Pierre, I think they know that that would be more likely. And I said this on the podcast too, that that would be more likely than them doing it with Connor. Um, Cause I don't think the, I think the fans know that Connor needs to get back in the win column. That I don't even think the casual fan has the audience right now has the, has the appetite for another Connor rematch with Khabib without Connor being in the win column. And I've seen other articles about Connor and Frankie Edgar of all people and stuff. Um, this I could actually see the UFC doing because Khabib wants it. GSP wants it. There's huge money in that fight. And uh, um, I, I can see that going down. What do you think, Miguel? Yeah. I, you know, I'm Tony Ferguson. I'm worried. You know, I mean, the bottom line is, is, uh, you know, the UFC's evolved in the last decade or so to the point where it's hard to say, what type of individuality and types of things are in contracts. But from what we traditionally know about UFC contracts, right? Ferguson's on some type of deal that may have been, you know, a four fight deal and he's on the third fight of it or the, you know, he may be even on the last fight of it or whatever. So, but he's obligated to do, he's got to fight on his contract. They're not negotiating a new contract, right? So if he's got to fight on his contract, he's got his amount for the fight, the minimum and, and the win money. It's in the contract. Now, when you're in a title fight, it's five rounds. There's probably some bells and whistles. Your Reebok money goes up when you're in title fights and, you know, this, that, and the other stuff. So there's some negotiations around it. Uh, it'll be on pay-per-view probably. So there'll be the, you know, does he get pay-per-view dollars and at what level, you know, does he go from a dollar per pay-per-view to $2 per pay-per-view of a certain amount they're sold and stuff. That's, you know, that's what's up in the air, right? So it's like Ferguson, you know, thinking, well, they're going to have to write me a, a separate $2 million check or I'm not doing the fight. That doesn't sound like Tony either. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's like, so that sounds like other guys who maybe think, you know, all of a sudden they made the paydays and stuff and they got to get paid like McGregor. Um, but again, Ferguson's not really been a, a guy that, you know, you know, is looking at least publicly, right? Looking for the money and stuff like that. And, and and there's only a limited amount that goes into what the negotiations are at this point, because you know you you've got some leeway, but the UFC does have all the power, right? 
So Ferguson, I don't think you know Ferguson's in a situation where a no is coming. You know, it's just simply not going to happen. They've also made the fight a couple of times, at least in the past, and it fell through because of injury. So mm-hmm. the fight's been made. You know, make it again. So I now, agree. now you it becomes. Like, if you switch over to the boxing side, you've got Deontay Wilder announcing that he may be fighting Luis Ortiz, and it's supposed to be November. And now, all of a sudden, in November, we've got, uh, you know, short notice, Tyson Fury won. Maybe Luis Ortiz gets to be the odd man out. You know, are they going to odd man out Ferguson again? Then they should just move on and do it and and, 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 and get all this, like, delay and waiting, and we're going to see what, you know, if to- if Ferguson falls through, when are you going to go, what's the secret? When are you going to go negotiate this with Ferguson? When is this conversation going to be had? It should have been had a week after the Khabib fight. I, I totally agree, but I, and I think that the word is out that that is the fight to make, and I just, I hope that they make it through, I, and it just, when you see these anomalies or George St. Pierre popping up, it gets me a little nervous. Miguel, I hate to do this, but I am going to have to cut this short. I got I got work calling me and blowing me up, and it's kind of distracted me. But we, we will get back on later tonight, um, maybe on the road, and uh, re- and finish this up. But um, this has been a uh, CRP News Roundup. We have a lot more to cover soon in the next day at least. So um, I hate to cut this short, but uh, I do got to get going, though. But um, good talking with you, Miguel. No problem. Yep, a lot to catch up on, so uh, look forward to uh, – uh, conversing a little bit later tonight, everybody. Please like and subscribe. Uh, got a lot of good points off on this one as well. Always a pleasure, Devin. All right. Talk to you later.